Because the leaves live on the street and you rip them off and they die. Good evening and welcome to the 2018 Interscholastic Unified Outdoor Bocce State High School Championship pre-competition webinar. I am Brian Montgomery, Chair for Unified Bocce. And first, I would like to say congratulations to all of the coaches and teams who have earned advancement to our 2018 tournament. As you all know, that this is the culminating experience and event for the 2018 outdoor bocce season. And of course, with that being said, in this webinar, you will be provided with all pertinent information that's relevant to the tournament and uh, everything you need to know to have a successful and fun day at the tournament. So of course, as you know, our tournament is scheduled for next Tuesday, May 22nd, 2018, and the inclement weather date for that is the very next day, Wednesday, May 23rd. And a few pages down, we'll review the policies and procedures for if the tournament is postponed due to inclement weather. Schools are scheduled to arrive between 9 o'clock a.m. and 9.30 a.m. And warm-ups will be available for teams on courts 1 through 7 from 9 o'clock a.m. until 10.15. Opening ceremony will begin promptly at 10.30 a.m. and then competition will commence at 11 o'clock a.m. The approximate time for the conclusion of the competition and the award ceremony is three o'clock and four o'clock is the tentative time for departure. This year's tournament again is being held at Washington College within Roy Kirby Jr. Stadium, and the address is provided there, 300 Washington Avenue, Chestertown, Maryland. And approximately 300 students from various districts will be participating in the tournament. The counties are listed there. Anne Arundel, Baltimore City, Calvert, Caroline, Cecil, Dorchester, Kent, Queen Anne, St. Mary, Somerset, Talbot, Wacomico, and Worcester. Credentials. So, it is very important that all non-student athletes, and that includes any coaches, any team managers, any instructional assistants, parent volunteers, um, other teacher volunteers, interpreters, per professionals, dedicated aides, who will be serving in any capacity to assist the team and or any student athlete. They must be credentialed with a Class A clearance through Special Olympics Maryland in order to be able to participate officially with the team. Those who are officially registered for the tournament and satisfy the Class A requirement will receive a credential in the team's delega delegation packet upon arrival and check-in. Credentials will not be issued on site. Again, credentials will not be issued on site. So coaches, please survey, of course, yourself, your assistant coaches, and any adult or students who are non-student athletes who will be serving in any type of capacity with your team, vet them to make sure they have received their Class A clearance. If they have not, uh, ASAP, we need to have their information. So you can email myself or you can email Melissa, Melissa Kelly, but it's very important that uh, that Class A clearance happens before or is executed before the day of the tournament because again on the day of the tournament credentials will not be distributed so as i said before opening ceremony will begin at 10 30 a.m and of course this is an excellent opportunity uh, for us to recognize and highlight those who have demonstrated except exceptional sportsmanship and behavior during the regular season so if you feel that any players in your, on your team are deserving of participating in the opening ceremony, please complete the survey at, at the link provided. And different roles that are available for student athletes to fulfill are torchbearers and oath performers. So again, if, if you have any athletes or unified partner or partner pairs, as well as coaches too, who you think would be willing and are deserving of participating in the opening ceremony, please send your nominations and using the link provided. Again, awards will begin approximately three o'clock or 3.15, uh, 
and it will be presented as teams place of finish is determined. So that, that's across the board for all divisions. Team checking will be available at the control center tent on the track slash competition level. And again, in a minute, you'll see a diagram of exactly where that is. So upon arrival to the venue, we're asking that one coach from each team check in. That coach will report any scratches that you may have for that day at the time of check-in. So any athlete who is not in attendance or who won't be able to participate that day to um, whatever reason that may be. At the time of check-in is when you'll report that, and then you'll also receive a delegation packet. And that packet will, uh, will be your lunch tickets as well as several cop copies of your official rosters. So you'll receive that. And then what we're asking is for all of the other team members, that means any other coaches, any um, non-student athlete personnel as well as the student athlete themselves to proceed to the inside of the venue to the bleacher area. Please do not allow your student athletes to congregate either in the entryway or in the lobby unless they are of course using the restroom or visiting the concession stand. Again, coaches will be provided multiple copies of the registration. And the reason for that is each coach will provide one copy of the registration to each scorekeeper prior to each match. So you'll have enough rosters to have for each of your matches. And what you're to do with that is to give that to the scorekeeper at the beginning in which the roster will be checked and verified, making sure that you are in compliance with the rule of two people having disabilities and one without participating in each match. Medical personnel will be available during the competition and they'll be identified with medical apparel or garments. With that being said, coaches are still expected and required to maintain their respective school system. Risk management, precautions and procedures, that includes traveling with student athletes, emergency cards, and any medical slash first aid kits that you're required to travel with. If anyone, student athletes or otherwise, has any type of critical or potentially critical medical condition, we're asking that you notify tournament personnel at the time of check-in. So when you go to the control center and report any scratches and receive your delegation packet, that is where you would report any um, situation that could that's deemed as a medical condition or potentially a critical medical condition. If there are any advanced accommodations that need to be made, that can include private changing areas that may be needed or private feeding areas, please email Melissa Kelly. Her email is provided there, mkelly at somd.org, as well as your respective regional sports director as soon as possible. So, <clears throat> of course, if you're on this call, uh, as soon as possible, we're asking that you do that this evening or maybe tomorrow during the business day so that we can make the necessary accommodations available for you. And below, as you see, we have the three different regional sports directors and their contact email, Kendu, that's with Ron Freeman and Kristen Mullins. So your ideas and your opinions are very valuable and important to us. And there are two points of feedback that we're making available for you to provide to us. The first one is any feedback that's specifically related to Tuesday, related to Tuesday's tournament. So um, upon the conclusion of the tournament, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, suggestions that you think we could use to improve our competition, then we're asking that you provide those at the link provided here for you, the Survey Monkey link. Again, that's directly related to the competition on Tuesday itself. And then should you have any feedback regarding the unified sports program as a whole, that's any sport, the program as a whole, we're asking that you direct those comments to Melissa Kelly. Again, she's a senior director of school sports for Special Olympics Maryland, and her email is provided there. As you know, volunteers are a very important part of Special Olympics and therefore a very integral part of our tournament on Tuesday. Volume volunteers are recruited from throughout the local community. 
and they support what we do in our competition. So if you know of anyone who is interested in volunteering, you can forward them this email address for them to register. That's volunteers at SOMD.org. And I want to be clear, this is for anyone who will be interested in volunteering at the tournament itself and as a whole. Please don't mistake this for a volunteer who will be traveling with your team or accompanying your team and serving one of your student athletes or serving your particular team in any type of role. Again, that person would need to uh, receive a class A clearance through Special Olympics and would be considered part of your delegation. Artificial noisemakers are not to be used while competition is in progress. This includes megaphones, uh, cowbells, thunder sticks, air horns, and sirens. For seating, there is ample bleacher seating available in the stadium for uh, all team members, spectators, family members, and it is handicap accessible. Uh, teams and spectators are encouraged to bring their own shade uh, in the form of tents primarily or commonly. So in the bleachers, you can put up tents to provide shade for your team. As you know, it could possibly be um, very hot and sunny that day. so. We want to make sure your team is as comfortable as possible. Um, tents, again, may not be set up in the bleachers, um, but they are not permitted in the first five rows closest to the track, just to allow for um, everyone to have a clear line of sight of competition. With that being said, we also want to give the caveat that if a tent is being used, uh, all measures are taken to secure the tent, especially in the case of inclement weather. Make sure uh, however you secure it is sturdy and reliable. The Games Committee reserves the right to require the discontinuance of any unsafe or potentially unsafe uh, tent or any other material or equipment that will be there. We're asking that teams or requiring teams without members who use any type of ambulatory devices to sit in the higher areas of the bleachers of course, so that teams who may have student athletes or coaches who use such devices are able to sit in the lower part of the bleachers and won't uh, have to worry about um, traveling upwards. So our inclement weather plan. Um, inclement weather decisions will be provided by 7 o'clock a.m. on the day, the morning of competition. In the case of inclement weather, a decision may be made to postpone the competition until the following day, Wednesday, May 23rd. And we have several channels of communication that we use to get those messages out to you. So provided is the Special Olympics Maryland Twitter handle, also a link to their Facebook page, a telephone number that you can call to receive the status update of the competition, as well as the Special Olympics Maryland website provided there at somd.org, in which if there's any communication that needs to be executed, it will be on the banner on the front page of the website. Excuse me. Of course, merchandise will be for sale, um, and the method of payment will be cash or credit. Excuse me, cash or credit card. And a sample of what will be offered is pictured below. Pretty cool gear. Again, here you have uh, an, an over bird's eye view of the venue itself, Roy Kirby Stadium at Washington College. If you follow the diagram and look at the statement to the right, you'll see that drivers are to circle around to the gate entryway, allowing team members to exit without crossing the parking lot. So again, if you follow the, the red line, you'll see where the buses are to be directed to drop teams off and by doing so no one will have to cross a parking lot unless you are right in front of the entrance of the stadium there all vehicles including personal vehicles and buses are to adhere to the posted parking regulations that you'll find on the campus Drivers of buses and, and cars should park in the parking lot just south of Washington College off of Washington Avenue. So here again is a diagram for bus drivers and other 
uh, drivers, including spectators, to adhere to when entering the college. So please make sure you have this available as your, your teams and parents enter the facility. Here is a diagram of the venue. So down at the bottom of this diagram, you'll see the number six indicates where all team members, all delegations will actually enter the stadium. Um, number five, just inside of that, is where you will find concessions and the restrooms proceeding vertical on the diagram. Number three, right at the track slash competition level, is where you will have this match schedule as well as results. And then that's also the location of the team warm-up check-in, which I'll cover in a minute. But please remember where the team warm-up check-in is. To the left, you have where the lunch distribution will take place, as well as the award ceremony. And then you have where the team check-in and where merchandise will be sold. Of course, if you are sitting in the bleachers and facing the field, the courts are numbered from left to right, one through eight. And now we'll speak on a few points of emphasis regarding competition. So the rules and requirements that are outlined in your 2018 Unified Outdoor Bocce Coaches Resource Guide will govern all competition. So again, team checking will be conducted in a tent that, that you saw noted on the venue map. Again, one coach from each team will check in upon arrival and, and report all scratches. <clears throat> so here is where <clears throat> we will be adhering to a specific warm-up procedure. So to better allow teams equal access to the courts for warm-up, what we will implement this year is a check-in process on the courts which will be administered by tournament personnel. So below are the steps that your team is to follow to ensure adequate time uh, for warm-ups. Again, warm-ups will um, occur from 9 o'clock a.m. until 10.15 a.m., closing promptly at 10.15 for the preparation of opening ceremony, which begins at 10.30 a.m. So immediately after your team checks in to the tournament and receives their delegation packets, uh, teams would then, if you would like to warm up, what you would need to do is send one representative, preferably a coach, to the track level shade tent that I went over before, not the control tent, but the track level shade tent, and check in with tournament personnel. What will happen next is tournament personnel will actually assign a time for your team to return, return to the court and actually the court that your team will warm up on. So upon receiving your time, you will go to your bleachers, get settled, and then return prop promptly for the time that you were assigned to warm up, ready to warm up. The time for warm up will begin at the time that you are assigned upon checking in for warm up, not at the time that you arrive to the actual court to warm up. So please, that's why we ask, um, arrive on time and then arrive ready to rock and roll with your warm-up slash play. Teams will use the balls that are already positioned on the court and then return them to their initial place once the warm-up has concluded. So when you come to warm-up, please have your ball stay at your location in the bleachers and just come ready to warm-up and do not bring your bocce balls. So a note on lineups, your team lineup may only consist of players that are listed on the interscholastic bocce postseason registration. So when I referred to rosters earlier, this is actually the exact form that I was referring to. So everybody should be familiar with the postseason registration form. That is what will be used um, to determine or verify your team's roster. Again, a copy of this document will be provided at team check-in. Of course, during actual competition, uh, you have two options for each frame. 
and you must follow one of the following options. So option one, a single frame must consist of two players with two with disabilities and two players without disabilities. So basically a ratio of two to two athlete to partner. Or option two, which is three players with disabilities and one player that does not have a disability, which of course is a ratio of three to one athlete to partner. So again, you must follow one of the two options. And of course, with that being said, each player is still to have a like role will still have approximately um, equal throwing opportunities during each match. So as coach, you must make sure that your players rotate end to end in a way that it provides for uh, each player to have a an equal amount of throwing opportunities during each match. Of course, a team which has eight players would just have four players assigned to one end and four players assigned to the opposite end. And if one end has a group of less than four players, so your team has seven players or less, like I said, the coach will rotate players needed to reach four on each end and also to provide for equal throwing opportunities. Any player that requires accommodations, please, that should be notified to staff personnel upon check-in, and then a notation should be made on the lineup sheet. And accommodations, include but are not limited limited to players with visual disabilities of course in which that player can use an elevated visual cue such as a cone or a cylinder or a teammate that can stand behind the palina and provide verbal cues um, the caveat with that is if that's the case then that player or coach cannot actually coach the athlete but rather provide a verbal cue such as I'm standing in the back of the Palena. Now with that being said, tournament, tournament personnel will advise each coach in a respective division if there are extensive accommodations that are needed um, and are approved. So example, a teammate remaining on the court while another is attempting to throw. So all coaches in all divisions will be notified if any team in their respective division um, is allowed to receive that accommodation or any other extensive accommodation. Only registered student athletes and non-players with credentials are permitted to access the competition area. So what that is, is down on the field. So that means if a person does not have uh, a credential or is not a student athlete, they must remain in the spectator area, which essentially is the bleacher area. All right, teams are only to access the competition area either during warm ups or during their scheduled match. So if it's not time for your team to warm up and if it's not time for your team to complete, compete, please make sure your team, your student athletes, remain in the spectator area and not in the competition area. A picture here is provided for what's considered to be the coach's box. All non-players are required to remain within the confines of the coaching box, which of course is the area that uh, starts at the 10 foot fault line and then ends behind the end line. So that means if you look at this, as you move closer to the midline, during play, that's actually outside of the coach's box. Now, with that being said, non-players can transition from one end, of course, of the court to the other end of the court in between frames. And an exception to that. For those players that do require additional assistance and support due to their level of disability, a coach, preferably a teammate, though, may assist that player onto the court and if necessary, provide assistance with physical balance, but they may not in any form or fashion direct, instruct, or assist the throw of the bocce ball. So violations will be handled accordingly. Violations will be enforced over the span of the entire tournament. So here you have the violation. So if a violation is committed, the uh, first penalty is a warning. 
The second offense is that the opposing team is awarded one point, and then the third offense is the coach's credential is pulled and access is revoked for the remainder of the tournament, and the opposing team is awarded one point. It's very important to remember that these violations accrue over the course of the entire tournament and just not over the course of one particular match. So if you receive a, more, a warning in your first match and then you commit a second offense in a subsequent match, then you will receive the second offense penalty. So the team that you will be currently playing in which uh, competition or against you committed that second offense, then a point will be awarded to that team. So please keep that in mind. And this is always important, a, re a reminder, coaching or instructional assistance may not be provided by a coach or teammate once a player steps into the court. So as long as a player, of course, is outside of the court, then teammates and or coaches can provide assistance and coaches. But once they step into the court, no assistance or instruction can be given. Um, and that's very important for you to relay to each of your players because commonly what happens is a player steps onto the court and the coach may remember the rule, hopefully, but teammates may not be um, as adamant or as reliable, I guess, in adhering to that rule and they'll provide assistance to their teammates. So please relay that. Also, what will happen is a player will step in and once in, they'll look to the coach or to a teammate for assistance or instruction. So please reinforce that before competition that once you're in, you're in and you must roll. Um, so with that being said, once you're in, i uh, sorry, you cannot step back out of the court to receive instruction. Now a note, a note on that, depending on if extensive accommodations are needed, which are approved by turn, tournament personnel, those extensive accommodations may override that aforementioned rule of coaches receiving, oh, sorry, giving instruction. So in that case, of course, again, all opposing coaches will be notified prior to each match if those extensive accommodations are needed. At the conclusion of each match, results are confirmed the following way. A credentialed coach from each team, so in this case, though you may have a paraprofessional or student aide or any type of volunteer that is credentialed to travel with your team and assist your team, only a credentialed coach from each team is uh, permitted to come and check the score, settle any doubtful points during the frame with tournament personnel, and then sign the scorecard, which signals that the scorecard is accurate. So that signature verifies accuracy. Once a signature is rendered, the result of that match is final, regardless of any protest. So before you give your signature, make sure you agree to what the scorecard reads. The scorecard will then be retained by the court official and submitted to tournament personnel for score tracking. Uniforms, all of your players must be dressed properly for competition. And we cannot stress this enough. Please ensure that you are 100% crystal clear on the uniform requirement and make sure that you clearly communicate that to your players. Anyone that is out of uniform will not be allowed to compete. No exceptions will be made, and every player will be checked for proper attire at the team registration table. And you can refer to the 2018 resource guide for a complete list of uniform requirements, but below are some general reminders uh, for you to pay attention to. So in terms of bottoms, a player's bottoms must be either shorts, skirts, or athletic pants. So for example, sweatpants. And ideally, you would want those bottoms to be of your school color but uh, or black or white. No jeans of any color, though, 
will be permitted, however. So no jeans, they could be denim, they could be any color, uh, but no jeans of any color will be permitted. And then this highlight is very important. Bottom garments are to be of the same single solid color with no pattern or design. So below are pictures of bottoms that are not compliant to the aforementioned rule. And we'll just take a look at that. So you'll see here bottoms that would not be permitted and that's due to them not being of a single solid color. Athletic sneakers must be worn. So that includes uh, or that uh, precludes a student from wearing um, sandals, flip-flops, open toe shoes, um, boots. Only athletic sneakers are permitted. No jewelry whatsoever should be worn. worn. And in terms of headgear, hats are permissible and actually encouraged due to, of course, the sun and outdoor bocce. Headbands, wristbands, and armbands are permitted, but they must be of a solid color. If a solid color, a piece of material may be folded, tied, and used as a headband, as long as it's not wider than two inches. And of course, religious and medical related headwear is permissible. Any visible garment that's worn underneath the uniform top and or underneath the uniform bottom should also not be adorned with any type of pattern or design and must also be of a single solid color. Doesn't have to necessarily have to be the same length, of course, but it must adhere to the single solid color rule. Um, leggings cannot be transparent above the knees unless covered by the shorts. So looking at the bottom three pictures from the left, um, those leggings definitely would not fit uh, that rule. And a note on this year's Student Leadership Conference, which is always a great event. So this year's conference will be held at Howard High on June 9th, and that's located in Howard County. And the goal of the Student Athlete Leadership Initiative is to develop and produce student leadership skills that enhance sportsmanship, promote teamwork, time management, perspective inclusion, healthy lifestyles, and community service. So at the conference, uh, students uh, are able to interact with dynamic guest speakers and attend breakout sessions where they work with one another and share ideas and concepts. And here's a great quote by Donald McGannon to support that leadership is an action, not a position. So act and go ask your coach or athletic directors about this uh, very exciting opportunity. Again, that's June 9th at Howard High. Please share this again with your athletic director, um, other coaches, and especially your student athletes. And here are our sponsors. Thank you so much for taking the time to attend. Um, does anyone have any specific questions about anything that I went over? If so, you can unmute your line now and ask away. Uh, Brian, this is Mike. Uh, they actually will need to raise their hand. Uh, they can't directly unmute their line. Okay. Um, if I... Hi, Emily. How are you? Good. And you, Brian? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks. So we had a question about um, at our district tournament. Our girl, a couple of my students were wearing um, Sanooks or Sperry's. Are they going to be allowed that for the state tournament? I believe Sperry's will work. Uh, I know just thinking off the top of my head, if I'm thinking of the right shoe, what I'm thinking of will work. Are you able to send me a photo of it this week? Yeah, I mean, the Sanooks are pretty much like the Sperry's 
too. They're closed toed and everything. Um, and we thought that was like the main issue. Right. I just, I, I, I think they will work. I don't want to be uh, wrong about that. I'm not 100% sure if Mike or Melissa are to chime in. But I'll definitely have a definitive answer for you by, uh, by in the next couple of days. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would need to defer to Melissa. Okay. Coming to you, Renee. Hi, Renee, how are you? Um, the Class A clearance. How do I know that all my coaches are cleared? Um, if you would uh, email, you can email me their names. I'll reach out to Rachel Maddox of Special Olympics. I'm not sure of her specific email address right now, and uh, she would be able to let me know um, how many okay. coaches are in question. We have four. I have okay. three. I have me and three volunteer coaches. Okay, so if you just when uh, if you could email me their names. Okay. Uh, I have a credentialing list uh, up to date right now, and what I'll do is I'll check it tonight, and if they're not on there, I'll let you know ASAP. Okay. Um, where's medical going to be? Okay, we don't have it listed on here. It's usually down at the competition level um near the control tent. So that's 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 where it'll be this year, I'm pretty sure, near the control tent. Okay. Um the ratio of two to one, uh, no, two to two or three to one, is that each frame or is that yeah, each that's, match? No, that's each frame. Okay. Capri's okay? Yes, Capri's work. Okay. Last thing, jewelry. What kind of jewelry? So... Um, like necklaces, chains, um, bracelets, I believe stud, stud earrings are okay. Okay. So not, ooh, forgive me for not being well versed on my jewelry. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> the, yeah, like the big, hoop earrings, yeah, the big hoop earrings. I mean, I'm not going to have, like, big hoops or anything, but, yeah. Right. Um, last thing, our wheelchair people and the tents, like, in the bleachers, no way to shade them? Um, that's a great question. So what we may have to do, with my, what I may have to do is section off an area on the outside portion of the bleachers for that because we did say no tents um, on the bottom rows. However, that does not allow for a team with wheelchair student student athletes to have. So um, if that's the case, then a specific section will have to be, um, again, divided or sectioned off maybe on the outside, on the, on the end of the beaches, I'm saying, to accommodate that. Okay, thank you. All right, I don't see any other hands raised, so I'm assuming everyone is good. All right, well, thanks again as always, and I look forward to seeing everyone uh, next week. And again, I do have a credential credentialing list that uh, will be provided, so you can use, I'll send it out and you can use that uh, to check to see if your coaches are credentialed. With that being said, I hope everyone has a fantastic week.
Um, hope your questions have been answered. If not, you can always email me. Um, otherwise, I'll see you next week. Thanks.